Okay, folks, I think we'll, uh, we'll get things started. Thank you, everybody, for coming tonight. So hello, bonjour, Anin. Uh, thank you for joining us at today's event, Mapping the Dollars and Cents of Land Use Patterns. This will uh, be an insightful and thought-provoking discussion that expands our community's perspectives on land use patterns and their role in economic development and prosperity for the city of Peterborough. Uh, my name is Michael Papadakos, and I'm the Asset Management and Capital Planning Director for the City of Peterborough, and I'll be your host and moderator for today's program. Uh, first, I would like to share a land acknowledgement and some reflections before we begin. Uh, we respectfully acknowledge that we are on the treaty and traditional territory of the Mississauga and Anishinaabeg. We offer our gratitude to the First Peoples for their care for and teachings about our earth and our relations. May we honor those teachings. I think that taking a moment to reflect on this statement and our roles and responsibilities as treaty people is a very appropriate way to kick off tonight's event. Uh, we are about to embark upon, what we are about to embark upon is a conversation around land, its uses, and a definition of productivity that is very much centered in Western conceptions of social, political, and economic thought. And we need to recognize that while there are several uh, notable thought leaders and experts with us today, there are some voices and perspectives that are absent. So while the insights presented today will be incredibly enlightening and have immense practical value, we must recognize the need to position this discussion in the context of an ongoing conversation that incorporates broader perspectives and other ways of knowing that are necessary to ensuring we achieve a long-term goal of making Peterborough a vibrant, inclusive, equitable, and sustainable community that is prepared to meet the challenges of today and into the future. With the numerous complex challenges facing municipalities, ranging from significant infrastructure investment backlogs to pervasive social issues, to building resilience in the face of changing climate patterns, it is crucial that we are using evidence-based decision-making when planning our collective future. Data-driven approaches can help us break the cycle of unproductive narratives that lock us into the status quo that created the problems that we are today trying to solve. Within the city of Peterborough, we are facing an almost $70 million annual funding gap to maintain our existing infrastructure in a state of good repair and to provide the infrastructure required to meet the needs of a growing community. Every year we fail to make those investments, that gap grows. There are only two ways out of this hole, more funding from higher property taxes or user fees or reduced levels of service. And neither one of those options is particularly desirable. How do we get here? And what are the underlying causes of how we have ended up with such a backlog of required investment? And more importantly, what can we do differently today that helps us start reversing this trend and places future generations of residents and businesses in a more economically sustainable position? Hopefully today's discussion, along with ongoing asset management planning projects that are underway, uh, can help us along the journey of tackling this thorny and uh, challenging issue. So on that note, I am very excited to introduce our keynote speaker, Kate uh, Ryba from Urban3, who will set the stage for us today. Uh, following Kate's presentation, we will be joined on stage by three local experts for a panel discussion to unpack these concepts uh, for our local context. So uh, Kate, feel free to... Um, Feel free to sh uh, share, your, share your video so folks can see you. Oh, there we go. Um, so Urban3 is an innovative firm that takes a different approach to land value economics, property, and retail tax analysis, and community design. They empower communities with new insights into their own data. Their work makes a quantifiable case for better city planning, urban design, and smarter growth. And, and this is the key, they back up their stories with facts and figures. Kate Ryba is the Chief Operating Officer and Whip Cracker for Urban3. Kate's work focuses on developing relationships with clients' project management and policy facilitation after the analysis of a community is complete. Kate has the unique experience of being both a former municipal staff person and a formal, former local elected official. She is an urban designer, planner, and self-admitted civic policy geek. Uh, prior to joining Urban3, Kate ran her own civic consulting practice focused on creative placemaking, led a downtown revitalization nonprofit, spent five years as the youngest member of city council in Spartansburg, South Carolina, 
and worked as an economic developer. Kate holds a BA from Wellesley College and a Master's of City and Regional Planning and a Certificate of Urban Design from the University of Pennsylvania. Kate has extensive experience with local government, finance uh, and policy, urban design, and economic devel development. She currently serves as a board member of the Asheville Downtown Association, Asheville on Bikes, and the River Arts District Public Art Advisory and Selection Committee. Kate is also a founder of the Building Our City Lecture Series, which features national experts on urban design, planning, placemaking, transportation, and other community development topics to explore the role of thoughtful design in building livable communities. Kate is a proud member of the Urban Land Institute, Congress for New Urbanism, and Strong Towns. Please join me in welcoming Kate. Hey, good evening, everyone. Can you hear me all right, Michael? Are you able to hear me? I just wanted to make sure before I get started. Uh, yep, we're good, Kate. Can, you, can we, we check, can hear you, check. yes. Can you hear me? You can hear yep. me. Okay, yep. great. Okay, good. Just wanted to make sure. Wonderful. All right, thank you so much. Thanks, Michael. Um, I'm thrilled to be here with you all this evening um, virtually and, <clears throat> excuse me, looking forward to sharing with you um, some case studies from Urban 3 um, and uh, really, you know, kind of how we think about cities, land use, tax policy, zoning, economics, which all sound really geeky, but I promise this is gonna be fun. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, just getting over a cold, like many people are in this season right now. Um, so a little bit about me, like Michael said, um, I worked in um, city government, actually in my hometown. This is a sad picture of the downtown um, square um, of my hometown that used to just be a parking lot and had the great opportunity of working on the downtown master plan that, that parking lot became a beautiful park where people gathered. Um, so had that experience. Also got to get, you know, grown men and women to ride big wheels to celebrate our new road diet. So had a lot of fun as a city staffer. Later ran for office and was on a city council for many years. So I've had that experience with both on the ground programs and with policy. Um, moved to Asheville and have been with Urban 3 for over seven years now. <clears throat> and what I'm gonna do is share with you a little bit about Asheville. Um, and because it's really seminal to how our company came about um, and just give some examples to kind of back into how we think about city economics and land use. So Asheville is located in the Blue Ridge Mountains, which is where I am right now. Um, we have a lively music scene. Um, we have a lot of breweries, I think some of the most per capita in the US. Um, we also have nuns that ride tall bicycles and swallow fire. So we're a fun little mountain town of about 100,000 people. Um, it kind of going back, um, it, this is what Asheville used to be like in the 1800s, you know, much like Peterborough and many other places. This is what, what we all, all our communities used to look like. Um, <clears throat> but just fast forward a few decades and this is what Asheville looked like. And, you know, how did this change happen? Um, trains, tourism, tuberculosis. So we have a big tourism economy. Folks would come here um, to get over their tuberculosis and sanitariums, breathe that fresh mountain air. We had a lot of trains coming to Asheville. Um, but you know, like many communities across the US and in Canada as well, um, our downtown really died in the 1970s and 1980s. Um, the mall um, really sucked a lot of economic activity out of our downtown and our businesses, um, you know, went vacant. Um, and so this is what Asheville used to look like. Um, and it wasn't that long ago. You can see this in this picture here, that's a 1996 Chevy celebrity. So it wasn't that long ago that Asheville was like this. And, you know, today we have over 11 million visitors a year. How did it happen? You know, we had this de facto motto. I don't know if y'all have ever experienced this in your community. I know I did in my hometown when I was working in local government. You know, that we've always done things this way. That'll never work here. Don't even try. Um, so flash forward to the 1990s. Um, the man, the gentleman that you see in the black and white photo, Julian Price, founded um, an organization here called Public Interest Projects. They're a for-profit redevelopment um, agency uh, that um, bought downtown buildings, these empty buildings, and um, not only invested in making those buildings lively again and getting tenants in there and putting some of the first housing back in downtown Asheville, um, but also he invested in the small businesses. So seeding them, making sure that they were successful in the, those first few years when it's hard when you start up a business. and. Urban 3 grew out of public interest projects. Um, so our founder, Joe Minicosi, worked there for many years. So this is an example of a building in downtown Asheville and the public interest projects renovated 
um, you know, put like four rent apartments above um, and seated the independent bookstore below. So, you know, public interest projects and Julian, they really cared about data. So, you know, this is Mayor Michael Wimberg from New York City. This is something that we reference a lot at Urban 3, you know, bring us the data um, in order to make the, the financial decisions um, to ensure future financial stability for your community. So that's what we do at Urban 3. Um, we take really complex data sets, um, things like tax policy and zoning that are super geeky, and we make them into stories. And we do that because stories are things that people remember, right? And you're not going to remember a spreadsheet um, or a pie chart, but you're going to remember a story. And we take these complex concepts um, that, you know, even uh, when I was a city councilor, I didn't always understand all the minute details of the tax policy. I'll get to some of that um, in a minute. Um, and how do we make it super simple so that everyone has shared um, fiscal literacy when they're talking about how and where they want their community to grow and what growth has meant for them in the past? Um, we want to make things super simple so that everyone can participate in those conversations. Um, you know, we don't not everybody loves math and it's not scary math that we do at Urban 3 to help reveal the financial implications of land use. So bear with me. I'm going to do a little exercise with you all. So. You know, how do we compare cars? How do we think about um, different cars from an efficiency standpoint? If we thought about them from a miles per tank perspective, then the Ford F-150 would win every time, right? Um, but we don't do that. That's crazy, right? So we think about it on a miles per gallon, or for you all, it would be kil kilometers per gallon. And the BMW Assetto wins every time at 70 miles per gallon. So, you know, how do we think about land in that same way? We love to use metaphors to Urban 3. So if you think about Peterborough, as a farm, right? You're, this is this finite boundary of land that you all have. How can you create the highest yield from that land as a farmer? Um, how can you think about you know, your buildings really as those crops that grow the revenue that allow you to provide a high level of service to your rate payers? Um, and it's not that you should run Peterborough like a business. It's how can you create the highest yield to provide the highest level of service um, to your residents? So let's take an example um, from public interest projects to kind of back into this concept. So this is so this is a, a building that um, public public interest project purchased. It was vacant for over 40 years um, and worth about three hundred thousand dollars in the tax rolls. Today it's worth eleven million dollars. Now the city did invest in the public realm in front of this building, so wider sidewalk, you know, benches, street trees, etc. But over that 15 year period, the increase in value was 3,500%. Um, now, you know, do you have a 401k that increases by that amount? I know if, you know, if I did, I'd be sitting on a beach somewhere right now, right? So that's a great yield. That's a great return on a lot that's less than a fifth of an acre of that farm of Asheville, right? So let's kind of take this a step further. Um, now, we're not picking on Walmart here. Um, you know, it's just a typology that many communities have. It's a stand-in for a big box store, which you know I know that you all have in your community and every community has. It is worth twice what that downtown building is worth, right? But if we think about that efficiency approach, right, from a per acre basis, um, the land that is consumed by that Walmart is 34 acres of the farm of Asheville compared to that fifth of an acre with the downtown building. So if we look at the property taxes per acre, um, it's about a hundred times more potent than the Walmart, the downtown building is. It packs a big punch. Um, sales tax per acre, that's important here in North Carolina, um, almost double. Um, residents per acre, obviously, um, it has a lot more than Walmart does, and even jobs per acre. Um, and this is just the revenue side. If you think about the cost side, right? So you think about that huge parking lot in front of the Walmart with all the stormwater runoff, the amount of pipe it takes to reach that um, compared to the downtown use. Um, similarly, you know, the front road frontage in front of it, the cost side is important too, and I'm going to show some examples of that. But this is just kind of setting up for you how we think about, um, about land uses in cities. So what is a city? It's a finite boundary of land. You know, you have your borders. You're not going to expand into your neighbors. Um, you know, how can you maximize what you have in Peterborough? So if you look up in the Oxford Dictionary, the meaning of incorporate, it's to constitute a company, city, or other organization as a legal corporation. So you, as Peterborough, are, are a corporation. And, you know, as a U.S. example, um, our president, Joe Biden, back in 2016, when he was still vice president, said the United States is the largest corporation in the world. And we're such geeks. You can see down here in the lower right-hand corner, we went and looked up the code. Um, so, you know, cities are incorporated. And Asheville's worth about eight times Ted Turner, who owns CNN. 
Um, and we know that Ted Turner doesn't get up out of bed in the morning and look at Facebook to make his, his business decisions. He looks at data, right? So this is our city council, pretty cool. It's um, entirely female city council here in Asheville. Asheville's a $16 billion real estate corporation. And this is our board, essentially, of this $16 billion corporation. So making decisions, data-driven decisions for that, you know, a magnitude of that size, um, it's really important to think of it that way. So we've worked in about 160 cities across 42 states um, of the U.S., up in Canada and Guelph. I'm going to show that example in a minute and across the pond um, in Australia and New Zealand. This is pulled from a 60, um, 60 city um, sample set. And you can see that on the lowest end is um, a, a single family home and what it pays in county taxes. And on the other end is a mixed use six story building. This is an average. But you can tell that comparing like the mall or a strip center to a, even a mixed use development that's only two stories, you know, you're stacking value every time you add one more story to a building. So it's really interesting to see that this is, you know, this is an aggregate and it's a trend um, in every community. So here's a little anecdote that kind of speaks to some of that. So our, our founder, Joe Minicosi, went to the International Association of Assessing Officers Conference many years ago. He said it made a urban planning conference look like Burning Man in comparison. Um, and this gentleman, Charles Terrell, was there, and he is the director of property tax for Walmart. And he was making a presentation showing spreadsheet after spreadsheet about how his buildings um, depreciated over time. And so Joe got up and said, you know, Mr. Terrell, what's the useful life of one of your buildings? And he said, oh, you know, 15 years tops. We depreciate it down to zero. So by the time we're out of there, um, it's, you know, it's, it's ma maximized in terms of the amount of value has disappeared. So if, you know, the average house cat, you know, I'm a big cat person, sad, that live about 15 years. So that's the average um, lifespan of your Walmart. And if you make that choice in your community, um, how can you account for that choice? Um, why don't people see it? Why don't people see it this way? Um, and for us, we, we love to use metaphors. We, we kind of consider ourselves economic radiologists. So if you can take an MRI of your brain, um, can you do the same thing with your community? And that's how we think about our maps and our models. So, you know, I'm an urban planner. We love mapping. Um, this is how, as planners, we might typically map a community. So the highest value is in purple. Um, the lowest is in green and non-taxable is gray. So those are um, some public lands that we have on either side of our county. This is Buncombe County where I live. That large blob you see in the center is the Biltmore Estate. In America, it's actually our largest privately owned home. It's worth over $100 million, um, and it's on 8,000 acres of land. So it has a massive gas tank in the county of Buncombe, right? Um, and this is its total value. But if we shift it to that value per acre, then the map changes, and the Biltmore Estate becomes that lowest value category because it's taking up so much land in our community, even though it's very valuable. And then let's look at it in 3D, um, which these are, you know, the maps that we're known for. So you can see, you know, my ninth grader could tell you where is downtown Asheville, right? Um, and it's, you know, we're a community of about 100,000 people. But if you look over to the right, you can see Black Mountain. That's only 8,000 people. Um, they have a four block Main Street and they've got two and three story buildings max. So at Urban 3, we're not saying everybody needs to live in a downtown or everybody needs to have high density everywhere. It's, you know, how can you make those choices so that you can have um, enough value in your community to pay for those other less um, you know, value per acre yielding land use types. So we really believe in showing, not telling. Um, so visuals are a really powerful way, way to reach people. Um, so this is how we work. So we take data. Um, we, 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 when we go into a community, we gather every data set that's facially relevant that we can. Uh, we sort it, we clean it, we make these 3D analytics, we present them visually, and we tell the community's economic story. And we tell it in a way that's memorable so that as people are going forward with, you know, understanding new development that's happening around them, that they can put it in the context of what it means for them from a, a financial perspective. Um, and we do this work because 65% of the population are visual learners, and 90% of the information transmitted to our brains is visual. So it's not that you know, that people aren't smart, it's that people are busy and not everybody cares about tax policy and zoning um, the way that we do at Urban 3. And so we wanna meet people where they are so they can make really informed decisions about the future of their community. You know, we hear this, well, you know, that's North Carolina, my state, my place is different. We, like I said, have worked in over 160 communities um, and every community you see, you know, the, 
for the most part, the same type of, of um, development appearing in our models. Now, I'm going to show you some outliers and some cautionary tales, um, and we'll get to that in a minute. First, let's start, you know, in, in Canada. Um, so we had the opportunity, and Canadians are different, it's true. Um, these are some images that, uh, that our, our uh, founder, Joe Minicozzi, pulled. Um, Y'all are a little different. You're a little more, more civil when it comes to interactions um, in the public realm. Um, we had the opportunity to work um, up in Guelph back in 2014. Um, they, this is their, uh, oh, actually, before I get to that, you know, one of the things that we do with every project is a deep dive into the tax policy of the place where we're working. And when we did that in Guelph, um, that was our first Canadian project. And one, we, we actually, Public Interest Projects owns a music club. So Joe thought, you know, when we're looking at North Carolina's tax code, it's like this little mixer. But when we look at Can that Canada's tax code, it's like a massive soundboard at a huge concert venue with all these different knobs and dials that you can tune up or tune down. Um, so that was really fun um, experience. Y'all have a lot more bells and whistles than we have um, in North Carolina. So this is Guelph's model um, back from 2013. And you can see um, downtown popping up um, in those purple spikes. The reason why they were interested in working with us is they were considering some significant investments in their downtown area and they wanted to understand, you know, what's the return for that um, over time. And one of the interesting things we got to do um, was work directly with their staff and they updated their model every year. So that was 2013, this is 2016 and 2019. So I'll just show those side by side. So you can see that the, the types of investments that they chose to make um, in their downtown area created a super high yield over that six year period. Um, and we helped train their staff so they could continue to see the progress as they were making those investments. It'd be interesting to see what it looks like now. This is another, you know, another thing that comes up um, when, when we're working with clients. Um, you know, my community doesn't want density. Um, we, don't, we don't like that, we're a rural place. Um, so I'm gonna show you a quick example of that um, from Gwinnett County, Georgia. So they, <clears throat> the client uh, was actually their chamber and they said, okay, Urban 3, these are four words you can't say in our community urban, city, town, or municipal. We're rural people here in Gwinnett County. Um, it's kind of tough since our name is Urban 3, um, but we made it work. So Gwinnett County, it, Atlanta's there in the center of the, of the screen. Um, it's that red outlined area um, above Atlanta and it's, it's quite large. Um, and they said, you know, we, we don't want density. We're not a dense place, we're rural. We, we did a little, um, you know, poking around with the data sets that we had and we found there are actually about 1,800 um, people per square mile. Um, now, yes, Atlanta is denser than, than Gwinnett County, but all these other places in our data set um, ha were less dense than Gwinnett, when Gwinnett County. Mecklenburg, North Carolina has Charlotte. Davidson, Tennessee has uh, Nashville. Travis, Texas is Austin. Um, so these are places that, have grown, that all have you know, professional sports teams. Um, and those people have never heard of Lawrenceville, which is their county seat, um, or Gwinnett County. So that when we did their model, their value per acre model, you can see there's no purple. Um, and as we look at it kind of from the side, and then we flip it to kind of look at it in profile, it's like a shag carpet across the entire county. So they never built a core. They never built a, um, a place that produced a high value like we see in a lot of our other models. Um, you know, this this is actually what rural looks like. This is um, Orange County, North Carolina, where the University of North Carolina is. Um, and, you know, there are nodes here, right? And there's um, the powerhouse of Chapel Hill from an economic perspective. And then they've left, the rest of the county is rural. That's actually what rural looks like. Um, whereas in Gwinnett County, it's it, they just kind of spread this ooze across the entire county. This is their actually their highest value per acre building in the entire county at 7 million an acre. Um, and so when we looked at, we pulled from our data set, um, these other places, you know, Austin's highest value um, building is four, over $400 million and Gwinnett's topping out at 7 million. So again, they never built that core with that lasting value. And this is kind of a sad economic heart monitor, right? Of showing Nashville, Austin and Lawrenceville um, with Nashville and Austin being less dense um, than Lawrenceville, um, but you know, ha not having produced that high value per acre. So that's kind of a cautionary tale um, you can see. 
Um, so let's let's talk a little bit about cost. This is an example of a community we worked with with their comprehensive plan this past year, Hilliard, Ohio. Um, they were they kind of had this big shortfall, like what Michael mentioned that you all are facing. And we always like to map, you know, what's your current spending? We dig deep into the budget, and then you know what is actually needed. And we we got these numbers from you know their public um, public works folks from their utilities, um, and put them into these these charts. And you can see that they have about a $15 million shortfall um, specifically for their roads and their road replacement. Um, so they, in their comprehensive planning process, wanted to understand as we're planning for growth, how can we start to make um, a dent in that shortfall with these different types of new land uses we're allowing in our community? So this is a model that shows you know, the revenues and the costs stacked together. And so we started looking kind of at these, at these different land use types and what are their nutritional facts? So if you have a single family development, um, you know, how much is revenue is coming in and how much is it costing? Um, so, you know, single family inevitably um, is about in the in the red by ten thousand um, dollars. And then if we look at mixed use, it's in the net positive on a per acre basis. Um, if you look, we look forward to what's happening in their their small downtown. This is not a not a big place. It's a place of about 40,000 people. Um, they're about thirteen thousand dollars net with that downtown use, um, and so we, you know, we worked with them with the team to look at all these different types of land uses and what are their nutritional facts. So, as new development was being proposed, um, from an average perspective, they could really understand what they would expect in a return um, and a revenue generation um, for those different types. Um, so, really doing the math on the revenues and the costs as they're thinking about growth. Um, parking. Parking is a big issue. I'm on the Asheville Downtown Association um, board and, you know, we represent local businesses. We know parking is a big deal. Um, but, you know, what, what is the data showing us? So I'm going to show you an example um, from Indianapolis, Indiana. Um, we worked on a team that was uh, working for the um, for actually their transit agency that was really trying to drag the city along to increase um, their, you know, to change their zoning to allow for increased density. Um, so this is what Indianapolis's model looks like. We were really focused on um, the transit lines. So they had the red line already built. This is bus rapid transit, not trains. Um, and we were focused in on the blue line. Um, and so we first, you know, kind of did this diagnostic focused on, you know, how is the land being used currently? So in looking at the entire city, you can see roads, buildings and parking in gray, black and red. Um, and about 27% of, of the, all of Indianapolis is, is taken up by parking, 31% of roads and 42% buildings. So how does this map out when we think about what revenues these different land uses generate? So parking, buildings, roads, and we have everything else, which is like backyards, buffers, berms, et cetera. And they have a little bit of water as well. Um, but when you look at the value that's generated, obviously the buildings are creating the most value at $54 billion. Whereas, you know, roads are not an asset, they're a liability. So they're actually taking up $17.5 billion in the negative. Um, and parking's got a modest contribution when it comes to value at, um, at $0.5 billion. So one of the interesting things was kind of zooming in and look, take, if you take out downtown um, you, and you look at the blue line, um, the, the kind of the pedestrian sheds along their bus rapid transit line, they actually have more parking, more surface parking along the blue line where they were trying to concentrate development and density than they had countywide. Um, and part of that is because they were requiring two parking spaces per um, per new housing unit, for example. And just to kind of put it in context, we always like to, you know, have some local um, examples and try to, you know, give people a sense of the scale. So the Indianapolis 500, it's a big racetrack, you know, car racing is a big thing here in America. Um, and we basically let them know um, that by the numbers, about three Indianapolis 500 racetracks in parking were existing just in that blue line corridor. So they had plenty of parking. Um, and, you know, how does that kind of shake out when you think about, um, you know, what value parking is returning um, in taxes versus a building? So if you take, you know, the average amount of square foot of a building in, the, in that area, in the, in the county, is about you know 1,100 almost 1,200 square feet. The average parking size, a uh, space size, is 759 square feet. And then you know the road in front of that building is 922. So in terms of 
what's being generated in value, that that 1,200 square foot building generates on average $52 a square foot. The parking is 71 times less at 73 cents a square foot. And then obviously the road is costing, it's not generating value and it costs $22 a square foot. Now, and it costs that same amount in front of the building as it does in front of that surface parking, right? So how long is it gonna take um, for that building to be able to pay for that road replacement? So for the building, it'll take about 42 years. Now, you know, average roads, depending on climate, last between 30 to 40 years. So that's pretty good. Um, but if you look at the parking and what yield, the surface parking, what yield it creates, it would take over 3,000 years for that surface parking spot to help pay for that amount of road in front of it. So really understanding that, you know, not all land uses are created equal. Um, and when you think about having parking, particularly in an area where you're trying to generate um, where you're trying to implement transit, um, you know, it's it's not a high revenue generator. Um, and just taking that into account is really important. Okay, and for them, they have enough roads in Indianapolis that the city's responsible for to go from Indianapolis all the way to Anchorage. And they run out of money when their budget around Eau Claire, Wisconsin, Wisconsin. So that was a big wake up call for them. Um, so, you know, where do they go from here? Um, what we did as part of this team, um, we looked at several different um, pedestrian sheds around the station areas of the bus rapid transit line. And they're thinking about, you know, increasing the zoning in these areas. So we looked at their current value, what was being proposed in the zoning code that would create new added value and what those new estimated taxes would be if they changed their zoning to allow for more density, you know, just in these areas around the stations where they'd already invested in that infrastructure. Um, and what we found was even just these four stops would create $120 million in new value with that new allowed density, which would equate to $1.5 million in total property taxes per year. So, um, you know, through the project, we had a lot of success telling the story. And um, in the end, they changed their zoning code. And, um, and you know, those new projects are underway in those, um, those transit sheds. You know, we, we also hear this, you know, from, from clients as well. You know, we're growing. We have plenty of income coming in. Um, our, our friends at Strong Towns call it the growth Ponzi scheme. Definitely go check out strongtowns.org. If you're getting excited about what I'm presenting tonight, you'll really love Strong Towns. Um, so please check them out. Um, so let me, let me show you uh, an example of, um, of this. So this is a client of ours, Eugene, Oregon. Um, they are um, a college town. You know, they have a, a university the way that you all do with Trent. They have University of Oregon. Um, they're, you know, they're Oregon, so they have something called urban growth boundaries that restrict growth on their edges. They came to us and said, you know, we're thinking about expanding our urban growth boundary. Um, is it a good deal for the city? Is this a good idea for allowing additional growth on our edge? Um, so let's do the math on that. So we looked at both their revenues. That was their revenue model. We looked at both their revenues and their expenses and netted them against each other. So you can start to see what's creating more in, in revenue than it's consuming in, um, in costs. So let's look at it in 3D. So you can see that downtown, um, and what's, what is in black is net positive, what's in red is net negative. So you can see downtown obviously is net positive. Um, but if you look in the upper right-hand corner there, you can see Crescent Village. That is a, um, you know, kind of a, small new urbanist community. It's not, um, you know, it's got three stories and mixes of uses um, and it's popping up and it's actually more net positive than net negative. Um, if you look underneath their model, like the worm's eye view, um, you can see that it's kind of a death by a thousand cuts, right? And so we really wanted to dig deeper into that data. Um, and so one of the things that we did um, was something we love to call the Brady Bunch slide. Um, so these are, you know, different land use typologies in Eugene. And you, so you've got low, medium and high density and then residential, mixed use and commercial. So we put, you know, what like we took a sticker gun and put the, the price tags on each of these land uses. And inevitably, and we've seen this in other projects that we've done um, for other communities like this. This isn't an anomaly. So, you know, single family residential is subsidized by every other use. And it's not to say, oh, you know, you shouldn't have a single family house, you're bad. Like shame does not work. It's it's really focusing on how can you use this as a tool um, when that next townhouse project is being proposed near a single family community to show that that you know those adjacent homeowners, hey, it's really important to have this um, this new use near you because it helps 
you keep your high quality of life. Um, and in Eugene, we noticed, you know, they actually have 81% of their, their land use is in single family. And, you know, you, we really believe in balance at Urban 3. Um, and so making sure that you have a balance of uses um, so that you're able to sustain your community from a financial perspective. So we said, you know, look at Crescent Village. Um, that's popping up. You know, change your zoning, change your impact fee structure in these different nodes where they've already actually invested in um, bus rapid transit to allow for higher density and create more of those Crescent Village style developments. And so that's actually what they did. And they decided not to expand their urban growth boundary. Um, but that's just an isolated condition. No, it's actually not. Um, so I'm going to share um, an example from a client of ours um, in Lancaster, California. Um, they are located in Los Angeles County. They're up and over the mountains um, in the Antelope Valley. Um, and they uh, this is their revenue model. I know it looks like they have a high purple spike, but if you look at that, they're topping out at about $3 million of value, um, which is not super high. And they also have, you can see on their outskirts, a lot of roads and land that is low value um, and underdeveloped. Um, and they're a town um, of about, uh, or a city of about 100,000 people. Um, so they have about, we, we determined working with their public works folks, 953 miles of roads they're responsible for maintaining and repaving, which is enough roads to go from Los Angeles to Portland, Oregon, which is pretty, which is a lot of roads. So we decided to put all their roads on a timeline. Um, so we got the data from their public works folks starting back when they first started collecting it in 1915. Um, so this is a chart that shows every year um, the amount of roads that's built. Um, so you can see in 1953, like a lot of places, there was a huge boom and uh, a ton of development. And, you know, that those roads have to be resurfaced again in 1983. If they're in the Antelope Valley, the desert, their roads crack up and have to be replaced about every 30 years. But, you know, in 1983, they also built, you know, that many new roads. Um, and so what happens is on a 30 year um, schedule, every time you build more roads, it's kind of, you know, it just increases exponentially. And you can see that there's this pattern happening that, you know, every time new roads are built, you have to account for that rebuild schedule in the future. So we said, you got to stop building roads. That's the big thing, because they were also having a shortfall. Um, and one of the problems we have here in the US, which I don't think you all have as much of an issue with in Canada, is that we catalog um, our roads as assets in our community's budgets. So, you know, an asset is this computer that I'm presenting to you. I can sell the van that I own. I can sell my house. But roads are not assets. They're liabilities. Um, and so for them, they wanted to know, you know, how many how much roads can we actually afford? And what we found was about half the network they owned they could afford. And so what they chose to do um, were several things, actually. Um, they decided, you know, those roads you can see out in the um, kind of hinterlands where there were no, um, there's no development. They deprioritized those um, on their paving schedules, um, really took them off. Um, similarly with cul-de-sacs, which we like to call publicly owned driveways, um, where, you know, you have two or three people that are using a pretty, you know, long road um, and the public doesn't have access to a cul-de-sac. They also deprioritized those on the paving schedule. Um, and then they changed their impact fees. And really to concentrate and allow for more development in their downtown. So here's here's another example um, in California as well, um, Rancho Cucamonga, California, which is like probably the most fun municipal name to say. Um, they're a great client of ours and we worked with them on um, their comprehensive planning um, approach as well. So here's where they're located. They're you know, similar to Lancaster. Um, they're also in Los Angeles County. Um, they um, are, you know, kind of in this ooze that we call um, the uh, the Inland Empire. Um, they never really built a core, and you know, because I'm from South Carolina originally, this is kind of a fun um, comparison that we did. Um, so the Inland Empire is about 4.6 million people, 2,700 square miles, and it is the same size as the state of South Carolina where I'm from. Um, but they, this is a population density map. So they've never really built a population center. Um, and Rancho was thinking, you know, can we be that center? How can we, from an economic development perspective, become um, the, the economic center of the Inland Empire? Um, and so this is their, this is their uh, model. And you can see that they have never really built um, a strong core um, at all. 
And so they're thinking about how can we change our zoning and our policy to allow for that as we go forward in our comprehensive planning process. So this is what they consider to be their downtown, um, an area called Victoria Gardens. And um, it is about 2.5% of their total taxable area. Um, and it creates about 1.5% of their taxable value, um, which is a one to 0.6 ratio. Now in all of the, the communities where we've worked, we've kind of aggregated all of that data. And one of the things that we've really noticed is that communities that have a one to six ratio in terms of the taxable area of, um, of their downtown and to its taxable value, that ratio, one to six is really a healthy ratio. Um, so we've seen that in time and time again, you know, Asheville has that as well, a one to six ratio. So for them, they were really trying to shoot for, okay, we've never built our downtown to have a healthy ratio um, from this perspective. What can we do to get there? And so their current value, um, taxable value of their downtown is about $391 million. And to get to that future new value that they're shooting for, that one to six ratio, um, it would be about $3.9 billion. So that's kind of their, um, you know, their missed opportunity. Um, so how do we get them there? So we worked with um, this larger comprehensive planning team with urban designers and zoning experts, and they pulled all these different um, comps from within the county. And, you know, because you don't have to put all the development in one place. Um, and so, you know, in spreading that out and, and adding new development in, you know, tactically in certain nodes, um, it will get them to that ratio. So, but it'll also get them to that ratio only using about 12% of their land. So you don't have to build density everywhere. It's just, you know, where can you put it tactically to create that value for your community? Um, and the other thing that's really interesting they wanted to, to do with us is, okay, well, you know, we, we want to add this additional development in these places based on our plan. But, you know, people are also coming to us with projects um, on a, you know, on a monthly basis. We want our planning staff and our planning commission and our, our council to be able to evaluate, you know, what are these new developments and how are they, how are they averaging up um, from how much are they creating in revenue versus how much they're consuming in cost. So we created a really simple spreadsheet for them um, with their numbers so they could actually evaluate new projects coming in um, and make that, you know, that critical decision um, about whether it's going to be a good deal for the community. Now, they might decide, yeah, we'll take something that's net negative because it's something that's a real community benefit. But it was a way for them to really stack up um, the, the different projects and evaluate them from a data perspective. And they used this. So they had a large steel mill um, in, in Rancho. And they, um, the steel mill had gotten economic development incentives that were, that were expiring. And they, they, were, they came to the city manager and said, look, you know, our incentives are expiring. Um, you know, we're, we're holding our hands out. We're ready for that, that tax abatement again. Um, otherwise, we're going to take a hike and go to Arizona. Um, so using our, um, our data and our analysis, they determined that the average parcel under an acre, so it's a much smaller parcel than what this giant steel mill was, in the same zoning category as the mill generated over two times the sales tax revenue, which is important for them in, in California. And so they said, you know, take a hike. Um, it's not a good deal for us. It would be better for us if you all took a hike and we get several of these smaller uses that are a much higher return for us. Okay, I've probably depressed some of you a little bit. Um, you know, what's a way out? So let, let's, let's end on a positive note and, um, and I'll, uh, I'll share a, a happy story with you all. So this is a client of ours, um, city of Lander, Texas. Um, they, they were considering, um, the city was considering funding infrastructure. So sidewalks and roads and lighting, et cetera, to make this new development happen. Um, now Leander, um, is it's near Austin, Texas, but it's nothing like Austin. It's a very suburban community. Um, it's the last stop on their commuter rail line. They do have a station, but and you can see that right here, but they've never really addressed it from an urban design perspective and built around it. Now, a new community college was locating in the lower area of, um, of you can see of this plan. And there's this outline in red here. This is a 115 acre site that a developer was proposing this new development and was really asking the city, look, I, I want a tax increment financing district uh, I want the city to help participate on the infrastructure to make my numbers work and make this happen. 
So this is what the plan looks like. You know, it's got a very traditional center with a green um, with higher density moving out to, you know, townhouses near the train station in the lower left hand corner, some big box like kind of offices um, and mixed use in other parts of, of it. So it doesn't build out all at once. Um, so we were hired to to really let the city understand, is this a good deal for us? What's, what is this going to do for, for us from an economic perspective? So at full build out, the total value of what we found would be about $733 million. So this is Leander's current existing condition. And you can see that they don't really have that purple spike either. Um, and they, they went from about a 3,000 person population back in the 70s and 80s to they're now about 80,000 people. But they Again, sales tax is actually important in Texas. They've never really built that commercial core. Um, and they had a lot of neighborhoods that were built at the same time. So they, they were seeing that kind of crescendo, that wave of infrastructure liability where they're going to have to, you know, resurface all the roads in a neighborhood that was built at the same time at once that was coming up, you know, seven, eight, ten years down the road. So here's what this new development looks like in the model as it builds out over time. So it peaks out at about $70 million of a value per acre. Um, so you can see that it dwarfs everything else around it from a value perspective. Now, we like to map things at more of a regional level if we can. So this um, shows their peers of Georgetown and Round Rock. And you can see that they have much a much higher taxable value um, than, than Leander does. And this, this new development actually doubles the taxable value um, of the whole community. Um, it's average across the whole place. We, we also like to use infographics when it makes sense. Um, one of the counselors was like, this is just a handout to the developer. Um, you know, why do we need to do this? And this graphic helped to show, you know, from the get go, you're starting to get money in the general fund from, you know, tax revenue of this new development. And then eventually you'll have, you know, it's a tax increment financing district. They call it TERS in Texas. Eventually you'll have that balloon payment at the end um, when it, it maxes out. That, but we always like to make graphics. If people have certain biases, we want to you know, show it with data, you know, is that true um, or is it not? Um, so this this kind of helps show that, you know, even three to four, five years in to the development, because, um, you know, it's a, it's a longer kind of um, span with, you know, it takes a while to, for full build out. Even with that half thermometer filled up, it, again, it's still really dwarfing everything else from a value perspective around it. Um, and then this is the final image from, from Leander. So we had um, another, another person on council said, you know, what, you know, let's just let the market do what the market's going to do. You know, we don't have a big box power center. We could just get that. That's sales tax. Um, and so what we did is pulled a comp from an, a nearby uh, community of that, you know, Home Depot, Lowe's, Best Buy kind of target power center. And what we found was that it would be over time about worth about $60 million in taxable value, whereas this new development would be worth about $733 million. So even if we're half wrong, it's a great deal for the city to go through with um, providing that infrastructure support. And the council ended up voting to support it and it's under construction today. Um, so let's think about Leander um, in the context of you all. Um, so I understand from talking with Michael that you, know, you have this land needs assessment, um, you have about 290 hectares of designated for a new greenfield community land area and 110 for a new employment area. So what would that look like um, if you think about, you know, building that? Um, it would be about 6.2 Leanders would fit inside all of that space. And similarly with the employment area, about 2.3 Leanders would, would fill out that space. So just thinking about, you know, as you're growing, um, what kind of growth do you want? Where do you want to concentrate it? Um, and what is the math? Um, we also have the super fun tool on our website. So if you go to urban-3.com, so it's T-H-R-E, so urban-3.com, there's something on there called the Urban Mirror. Um, and you can put in your community, which I've put in on the left here, um, and then it's you can put in any other place and you can zoom in and it'll, it'll zoom in and out at the same scale. So I have Buncombe County, which is where I am up on the right. So I just did, you know, a quick, a uh, quick walkthrough um, of looking at, you know, your downtown versus downtown Asheville, where I am. Um, one of the things I noticed, you know, I started to think about, you know, we looked at that Indianapolis diagnostic. What's all the surface parking that you have in your place? Um, and you can see there's a little more in downtown Peterborough versus downtown Asheville. Um, and so from Urban 3's perspective, our, our approach is if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. So 
you know, making sure that you do the math in your community is so important. Um, and what we do, we call geo accounting. So, you know, we're taking the numbers, we're putting them on the map and making sure that people understand the long term implications of, of the land use choices that you're making. You know, your accountant doesn't care if you buy a boat, your accountant cares if you can afford it. So understanding how those new developments impact your long term bottom line. And, you know, we, we love Bob Ross at, um, at Urban 3. I don't know if you all know Bob Ross, but, you know, just put your numbers on the map and don't worry about the mistakes. Understanding where you are is so important to then be able to understand where you're going. So th I'll leave you um, with this, this list that we like to kind of close with. Um, so if you, hopefully you've learned that, you know, from the Walmart examples, when you tax on value, there's an incentive to build junk buildings in your community. Um, and and that's, a, that's a challenge. So, you know, really being able to dial in um, and understand that as, as new developments are being proposed in your place is so important. Um, mapping your, your revenue on an apples to apples manner. So, you know, go into your tax rolls, like pull some different building types and, and do the value per acre or value per hectare, I should say, um, of those different land uses and see how it shakes out for you all. Um, really understanding what those different buildings and land uses are doing for your community's financial bottom line. Connecting your costs with consumption. Um, you know, thinking about that Eugene example, um, understanding how much uh, infrastructure you have and, um, and, you know, what it means to create more of it when you might already have uh, so much that it's difficult to manage from, uh, from a management, from a um, perspective of repaving, et cetera. And, you know, do this spatially. Um, don't just make spreadsheets. It's great to look at a map to really understand what the dynamics are from a geospatial perspective. Um, that's really important. Um, when you buy more stuff, it costs you more to maintain. So, you know, that it's it's really, again, I know I'm kind of like hammering away at this, but just understanding as, as you, you get like a, you know, a new developer comes in and wants to build something and then hand you all the roads, that is going to cost more in the long run. It's, you know, you've got to think about those long-term life cycle costs. Um, you know, be honest with information in a transparent manner. How can you um, make it super simple for your residents to understand what the value of new development or redevelopment means um, for, you know, for, for them and, you know, for your elected officials, um, you know, trying to make it as simple as possible. Uh, right. Explain it. I just finished my own sentence. Explain it simply. Um, yeah, what is the easiest way to explain a complex concept um, like zoning to, to your community? Um, and, you know, start small. Um, it doesn't have to be, um, you know, a, a huge project that starts to, to make an impact. You know, you can make little moves from a policy perspective um, to start to, you know, shift things. Um, and, you know, and learn from experimenting. Um, you know, don't be afraid to fail. And, um, you know, again, using those small policy nudges to see what the yield is. Um, so we encourage everybody um, to do the math. That's kind of our, our moniker. Um, and I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you all tonight. I'm really excited about the, the panel discussion and hearing from the panelists and, and talking more about this. So I'll, I'll stop there. Uh, thank you very much, Kate. That was a information-packed and thought-provoking uh, presentation. So I would like to welcome our panelists to the stage so we can follow that up with some discussion. So first we have uh, James Jorgensen, uh, a partner at GM Blue Plan and a board member at the Institute of Asset Management. Uh, James has over 20 years of consulting experience for municipal clients. He has been involved in a multitude of municipal asset management and infrastructure planning projects, including growth-driven infrastructure master plans, asset management plans, rate and financial studies. Uh, he has a foundational knowledge of all municipal public infrastructure assets with an expertise in water and wastewater uh, planning. Uh, senior, James is a senior partner with GM Blue Plan and maintains a technical project focus, delivering projects with a hands-on collaborative approach. It goes on. James is a wonderful guy. He's corporate member of the Institute of Asset Management and board member of the Institute of Asset Management Canada chapter, among many other uh, industry associations. So thank you, James, for joining us. Why don't you grab a seat? Uh, next, we have uh, Rhonda Keenan, uh, CEO of Peterborough and Kortha's Economic Development. 
Rhonda started in this role in 2016, and prior to arriving in Peterborough, Rhonda worked for the City of Oshawa's Economic Development and Real Estate Services for 12 years. Uh, she received her Professional Economic Development Certification in 2011, and has also completed her Master's Certificate in Municipal Management from Ontario Tech University. Um, Rhonda has always enjoyed the Peterborough and Kawartha's lifestyle and considers it a privilege to support entrepreneurs, local and regional businesses, and marketing this destination for visitation and investment. Um, finally, we have Paul Bennett, President of Ashburnham Realty. Born and raised in Peterborough, Paul got an economics degree from Wilfrid Laurier University and started Ashburnham Realty in his university years. His commitment to infill mixed-use developments that improve the livability, vibrancy, and economic productivity of our urban areas is reflected in the local projects he stewards. The goal of Ashburnham is to be true community builders uh, and do all they can do, sorry, all that they do with purpose and vision towards a more positive and sustainable future. So thank you. Welcome, everyone. Michael, I can't actually see anything, just FYI. I can't see the stage or myself, but I'm, that's totally fine. Just wanted to let you guys know. Okay, so uh, James, I'll start with you. Uh, you have a, uh, a lot of experience helping communities uh, grapple with many of these exact issues. Uh, based on what, uh, some of what Kate shared in her presentation, how does this track with what you've seen uh, from your work in municipalities across southern Ontario and Canada? And how would you characterize the evolution of municipal asset management practices on Ontario? And what are some of the conversations the community needs to start having to try to unravel this predicament? Yeah, thank, thank you, Michael. Um, well, I, I think I'll start by saying that I've been doing this for 20 years and I've just realized that it wasn't asset management, it was liability management <laughs> that I've been doing. And, and I think that's really hitting the nail on the head because assets that we look at, the municipal assets, they are the cost aspect of land as a business. Um, and I think in Ontario, especially where I've been working for the last 10, 11 years, um, there's been a rapid development of asset management concepts. And from the growth perspective, there's already now changes around how you go about development charges. And we're talking about area-specific development charges, so where it's more expensive to service those areas should be paying more for it. And I think that came through in Katie's presentation numerous times. So that's one development that's happened. And then obviously with the Ontario Regulation 588.17, which basically means every municipality has to do asset management, a lot of municipalities, especially the larger, more mature ones, have really embraced that. And they're looking at it as a way to minimize those costs of servicing. So the road example that Katie mentioned as well is another good one. And the idea of not having all your roads in perfect condition, but let's look at it in terms of, well, let's make sure 80% of our trips taken are in roads that are in really good condition. So you're trying to be more efficient about where you're spending your money on those municipal assets, which are essentially just a cost in the liability aspect of that overall value. So I think that a couple of examples which sort of sets the scene for Ontario in asset management. That's wonderful. Kate, are you having a hard time hearing us? I, I got it now. I'm all set. Okay, great. Because uh, I'm coming to you now, and hopefully you heard what James, some of James shared, because based on some of that, is there anything that you thought you'd like to add? And, um, you know, for example, are, are there any, what are solutions that can be implemented in a few months to help make Peterborough a more sustainable uh, community, fiscally sustainable community? Yeah, I think, you know, from, from a short-term perspective, you know, we, we couldn't make, I can't make a, like a policy recommendation until I've looked at your data and, and I know exactly what's happening um, in Peterborough from a, a policy perspective. Um, but, you know, in just doing, I did a, a cursory um, tour um, of Peterborough on Google Maps. And, you know, one of the things I noticed is, um, for example, Lansdowne Street, um, it's really um, what, what strong towns would call a strode, right? It's not a street, it's not a road. Um, it's it's a, a quite a large a large road. How could you you know retrofit and, and kind of change zoning policy to allow for a, a, you know a change there? Um, I think um, understanding um, your development patterns for a large scale new single family um, development. Um, you know all single family isn't created equal. I noticed you know there's some neighborhoods that you have um, you know single family houses with really large lots, um, some with smaller much smaller uh, lots. 
So understanding, you know, from a tax assessment perspective, um, you know, how is that shaking out? Um, I think that, um, you know, really being honest with your citizens about what the current um, state is of, uh, of from your financial health perspective, which it sounds like you're already doing, like, you know, that big number, that's like a, that's a huge first start. A lot of communities we work with, they haven't even, you know, started to grapple with, um, with what that number is and what it means for the future. So doing that math, um, I think is a great short term first step, um, just to start to create that as an understanding in your community. Well, great. Thanks for sharing that. Um, anybody have any thoughts they wanted to add or that? okay, good. Okay, um, Paul, next to you. So in listening to Kate's presentation, you likely feel that uh, you and your team are in the trenches and moving forward uh, some of these types of development projects that play a role in combating the trends that we um, find ourselves, that have put us in the position we find ourselves today. Uh, in your experience, what are some of the most significant market and policy barriers uh, that you encounter with these types of projects in, in Peterborough? It's, uh, it's funny because um, we got in doing what we do or, or building the way that we build to be community builders. And I guess, as you kind of pointed out, it was about 20 years ago. Uh, I got involved or got interested in this when we had Chuck Marome, I think, actually in this building um, eight years ago to talk about strong towns. And it's funny, you can think about what's best for the community and then you actually see the metrics and uh, it becomes really, really interesting about how we should grow as a community. Um, I would assume, and based on what Kate said, um, the things you're asking, all small towns struggle with. A, a big one is obviously density, it's, uh, trying to get thinking in 3D, not 2D. You know, the value of the volume of a piece of land, not just the acreage that it's on. And especially in smaller towns, it's so important because we really do have minimal numbers of, de of development properties that we can do the right job with. Um, you know, Kate did a great job of pointing out some places in Peterborough right now that are ripe for adding some density. Um, but it's funny, one of the biggest things that I think, and Kate, may, you maybe want to correct me on this, um, sure. I think leadership is probably the, the biggest thing that I see coming out of this right now. Um, for where we were eight or ten years ago, I, you know, inherently positive, I'd like to think that Peterborough hasn't screwed up yet. I think we're at a spot where we probably have a lot of work to do in this world. Um, but, you know, researching some of the strong town stuff, and Kate might want to talk about a bit about this too, it's what really hit home for me was uh, some of the, the cities and the states that, you know, there may not be any coming back from the sprawl that they have in terms of developing a tax base to actually support themselves going forward. You know, where in Peterborough, we actually still have a very definitive downtown, a great cultural um, heritage, um, not as good of a business sector yet, we would like it to be. Um, but I, I think we've got a lot of good to build off of. And some of these principles, it's so amazing to see that we're at a city run event talking about these types of things. Because um, I don't think every other city in Canada, obviously Guelph would be one, but there's not many that would have the type of uh, local leadership to do this. Well, uh, Kate, having heard some of Paul's experience and thoughts, any suggestions on what? Uh... Yeah, I, I think he's exactly right. I mean, I, in doing my my walking tour in Google Maps, um, you know, one of the things I, I noticed um, that's really huge that you all haven't done which is plow a highway through some significant part of your community. Um, you know, in Asheville, we did that. Um, so many of our clients um, have, you know, that mistake was made back in the 70s and 80s. And those neighborhoods um, that are adjacent to where that, that transportation choice happened um, have really borne the brunt of, of that choice um, in loss and value, obviously, you know, radiating out to create um, you know, an inhospitable pedestrian environment and just really stymieing um, revenue growth. So the fact that y'all didn't do that is is huge. Um, and you, know, you have these great assets um, in the rivers. And like, uh, like he said, you have um, a really intact downtown community. Um, one of the things that, um, that I was wondering about, and I'll be curious maybe when we get to the next question, is to talk a little bit more about um, your relationship with Trent and um, kind of what that means um, for the city and, and how to engage um, that campus to generate more you know, revenue um, and connection between maybe the downtown and the university. I'm not sure if that's a topic that, that will come up, but I was really curious to learn a little bit more about that connection. Uh, yeah, definitely in a, a conversation that's in flight, Kate, and uh, you, you probably didn't hear a couple snickers in the, in the crowd about a couple comments <laughs> there, so it's, uh, it's funny to hear uh, some of your perspectives that um, uh, yeah, um, and also we should also make note of Fleming, uh, Fleming College as well, right? We also have that uh, really strong college as well, and they're sort of uh, at 
like bookending our city, you know, one in the southwest and the and then the university in the north, uh, the northeast. So um, yeah, that's let's let's see if we get to some of that. So um, and we want to put a question on any of this, or should we keep rolling? I'll add a I'll add a little. I'll just jump on the idea of, of bigging up the city of Peterborough because it is all about the municipality and their their intention and what they're trying to do. The the city I know have a, a manager of asset management in place. There's a, a team that's supporting them and the concept of asset management in the city of Peterborough is very strong and it's accepted as the best way to go around managing assets. Not everybody has that. Um, some mm -hmm. clients I work with don't have that same philosophy and they have the budget that they had for the roads last year, they need to spend it this year. They don't know if it's the right amount of money, they just know they need to spend it. Um, so just that idea of Really embracing the concept of asset management is strong at the city, and I think that's uh, a really big, big part of the challenge. Well, thank you for those kind words. Um, it's only because it's true. <laughs> well, and uh, you know, it's, it's interesting to hear you say that. Though, and, you know, before we move on to the next one, just to, to kind of uh, riff on that a little bit, uh, uh, I always say that like an event like this, I'm hoping is like making a small stride towards making asset management sexy. Right, and I know that's not something that most people think about when they think about asset management. But I feel like it's really such a foundational concept for us to understand as a community and have you know honest, grown-up conversations about because we can see the predicament that you know not doing so has created over the last 50 to 70 years. So anything in terms, you know, having said that, you know, like you know, uh, one of the things we're saying a lot these days at City Hall is right to make things happen. We need three things. We need political will, we need community will, and we need bureaucratic will, right? So it sounds like we've got bureaucratic will. Um, I think we're working on, on, on political will. And then community will obviously is, I think, you know, not, probably gonna be a laggard, right, in getting people, because we, we had a really uh, interesting exchange even last night at General Committee talking about roads. And, um, you know, I, I tried to, again, make that point. I know everybody wants their road to be really nice, but there's a big bill, and if I present that bill, I'm really, really, I really doubt that people will pony up the cash to, to fix it, right? So, okay, Rhonda, uh, moving on to your perspectives on the broader economic development uh, topic, uh, what would you say are some of the innovative ways you could see leveraging this type of data and these perspectives to developing and tailoring economic development strategy for the Peterborough context, and what would be your biggest challenges in doing so? Well, thank you. Um, I think, you know, I'm really excited because I think it's so important to be able to see the numbers. Um, I think when we are trying from an economic development perspective to try to attract a company to this region, I think understanding that the city, you know, understands its numbers, understands what its value is, understands what it wants to do, is a selling point for us to be able to talk to companies to say, we do have our act together, this is what we're trying to achieve, and here's how you fit in. Um, I would love to be able to see, you know, how this type of information and data is used. Um, you know, I'm thinking even community improvement plans. You know, what is the what is the way that that you know, council city would actually use this type of of data to help make an informed decision of this is a project that we would back based on this data and this is one that we don't because it has to sit you know hit a, thir a certain threshold and i think this could be an excellent way for us to be able to help make decisions because you know we only have so much land it's precious and and you know making sure that we're making the most of it i, I can see this um, being a very you know a very innovative way to do it and i would love to see more of it so thank you for bringing this to us yep. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, Kate, um, having heard of somewhat Rhonda shared, do you have any advice or, or recommendations for how you might suggest we can better leverage this type of data in developing um, economic development plans? Yeah, I think, you know, going back to some of the examples I shared, like the Leander, Texas one, you know, really understanding, um, you know, like was just mentioned, um, what is the value of this new proposed development to Peterborough? How is this going to affect the bottom line um, of our community? Um, and being able to make that decision using data instead of, um, you know, bias or emotion or, you know, it, or, you know, having it not be informed from a purely numbers perspective. Now, like I said, um, you know, with the Rancho example, the Rancho Cucamonga example with the development evaluation tool, um, there may be a choice where, you know, you've got a community use that comes in that's going to 
create more costs and revenue. But being able to say, you know, the reasons why you're making that choice, I think is so important from a transparency perspective with your residents. Um, and a lot of our work really, um, you know, as a former politician, um, it provides a lot of cover for your elected officials to say, look, we're trying to make um, decisions that um, create a financially sustainable future for our whole community. Um, and um, this data is telling us that, um, you know, that this choice is the right one for Peterborough. Um, and, you know, really using that as a tool um, to communicate the why to, to your community, I think um, ha- we've seen it work time and time again, that, you know, in Leander and, and Rancho both. I think, you know, one other thing um, to, um, you know, that, that example from Eugene, Oregon, where they have that, you know, Crescent um, City, you know, that node of development, going back to what we were, I was mentioning a minute ago about your university, um, you know, is there a node of concentrated development that could happen um, up near the university? Um, you know, we we have a university here in Asheville, and we like to joke that, um, you know, a lot of students show up and they're ready to spend money. Um, so how can you, um, you know, harness that from a development perspective um, and, and make that as part of your economic development strategy? Um, one other thing that, um, that comes to mind, we've done a lot of projects um, in the past several years um, focused on public assets. Now, assets, as they were mentioned just a minute ago, is more focused on, you know, uh, infrastructure. This is, you know, how do you think about the land that the city of Peterborough owns um, and how can you use that land in a way um, that someone who's a real estate developer might think of it? So we, what we've done is work with cities to catalog all of their publicly owned lands and buildings and think about them kind of from a real estate development perspective and how could they use that, um, those assets to create ongoing revenue streams um, for the, for, rather than just selling it off um, and really think about it um, more tactically from a from an investment perspective. Um, so that that's one other thing that we've been working a lot on with communities, like what do they already own, and how can they think about it in a revenue generative way? Oh, great! That's some some interesting, um, really good, really good advice. Um, okay, about a general question here, I'll open it up to, to the group, and anybody can jump in. But uh, I want to get on the table this uh, the question of climate change, right, and specifically. You know, how, how will climate change impact development landscape of Peterborough? Uh, how do the ins, in, some of the insights of what we're looking at today, right, was very, like, um, very dollar focused, very economically focused, but, you know, how do these insights start to intersect with that problem of building resilience into a community? Kate, did you have, want to kick something off there? Oh. Oh, no. Kate, yep. Kate, Sorry. can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, sorry. Did you did you catch that question? I did. I did. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, there was just a notification on my computer. Sorry about the noise. <laughs> Any thoughts on how we can um, start Perfect. to integrate some of this thinking, and how does it fit into building resilience into a community uh, in the face of a changing climate? Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm not sure about your, you know, your flooding. I haven't looked into like your flooding maps, for example. Um, I'm not sure if that's going to be a huge issue for you all with some of our clients. They're really wanting to understand um, how will um, natural disasters like flooding or, you know, for our coastal clients, sea rise, how will that in fact uh, affect our total, um, you know, our taxable value um, as we're, you know, projecting forward into the future. Um, what, you know, what's likely to be impacted by climate change events. Um, I think, you know, one one topic that's huge that, um, you know, I talk about, I, I'm a member of the Congress for New Urbanism. That's another great organization. If you're really, um, if you're really jazzed about what we've talked about today, this will be a place for you to get great information and data. The Congress for New Urbanism, they have a, they're about to have a conference and they have a whole section about, um, you know, in migration. So is that something that you and Peterborough might need to think about um, folks from other places um, moving to you to escape from from climate change events? Um, you know, it's obviously the data shows it's getting hotter. Um, you know, at the very least, plant more trees. Um, consider um, looking at your zoning code. You know, um, where when I was involved in the downtown master plan in my community, one of the things we did um, we put a form based code in place for our downtown. And um, we gave um, all kinds of um, incentives for, um, you know, building a, a green building or adding a green roof, things like that. Um, so making it 
um, you know, allowing developers to add another story if they are going to build green. Um, you know, just maybe tweak this tweak you can make in your policy that doesn't, you know, cost you anything um, and maybe actually creates more density in a green building. Um, so those, those are just a few things off the top of my head without knowing exactly any like uh, a data from a flooding or other event perspective about Peterborough. Yeah, just to give you a uh, get you up to speed, where we are quite experienced with uh, with massive flooding events here in Peterborough, okay. and it uh, governs a lot of uh, a lot of our thinking on a day to day basis. So, uh, anyone, uh, gotcha. I don't anybody want to add anything to that or? Uh, sure, I can add a little bit to the climate change conversation. So, within that regulation that I mentioned, the the five eighty eight seventeen. Um, it says in there that all municipalities should account for climate change in their asset management. That's pretty much all it says. So it doesn't tell you how or what to do or, or anything about that. But what a lot of municipalities are doing is looking at what risks there are from a climate perspective that are likely to impact their infrastructure. So freeze-thaw for roads, for water mains, for example, the more intense rainfall and for flooding. So I and I inflow and infiltration into sewers in, in flooding from rivers and that kind of thing. And then what you can do to your infrastructure to make it more resilient to those threats. Um, so for the case of water mains in freeze thaw, make your design standards so that all new water mains have to be a little bit deeper so that it's below the, the freeze line, for example. So simple stuff, but it's just planning for that future climate. Um, from, a, from the rainfall perspective, obviously that's the key one in them flooding. So understanding where that new development is likely to go and then looking at it from, a, from future floodplain mapping and from future design rainfall events as well, which incorporates climate change. Um, some of the interesting stuff around climate change in municipal assets is you know that there's risks out there and we keep hearing from our clients that wind storms are a big problem, especially for facilities and buildings. But wind is an incredibly difficult thing to predict from a climate trend perspective going forward. So you've got to be careful about what things you actually use to make decisions to your infrastructure now based on how sure you are that these things are going to happen in the future. So it's a really complex uh, subject and municipalities are definitely addressing it because it could mean the difference between millions or billions of dollars of infrastructure and damage costs in the future is, as I know Peterborough have had some experience with. Yeah. Indeed, indeed. Uh, Paul, did you want to jump in yeah, on that? Uh, yeah, maybe not as much infrastructure based, but more planning based. Obviously, Kate mentioned the idea of incentivizing, you know, good buildings, green buildings. That's obviously, hopefully, that's going to happen all over the world at this point in time because of how important it is. But even from a, a planning perspective, of encouraging uh, full summer whole uh, neighborhoods from a service perspective, not just a residential side of things. I know Peterborough and we are all fighting the the battle against the car. Um, unfortunately, we have a, a very sprawled service sector, so you know there isn't that. You know where Toronto does have a lot of, and Kate alluded to this a bit too, of all those kind of neighborhoods and nodes that have full services with within them. Um, we we don't really have a lot of that in Peterborough. So from a planning perspective, if you do get that mixed use, um, full neighborhood, people can park their cars or not have their cars and live within a a small little sector. You know. That doesn't totally solve climate change, but I think that's one of those things that if we're able to cr create those full communities, it will do a much better job of getting the cars out of people, out of people's hands, and maybe each couple only has one, or they move on to e-bikes or something, because they can get all their services within a, a kilometer or two, right? Great. Rhonda, did you want to jump in? Yeah, I think at the end of the day, we keep hearing planning and we keep hearing policy, and uh, this tool that Urban 3 has introduced us today is really just telling us how we're trying to calculate this and how the decisions that we've made in the past are, are, are being represented right now. And it's a good tool for our, our you know, elected officials, you know, the bureaucrats in the community together to understand what those numbers are and, and work towards them in, in a, in a positive way moving and I think I think that's been part of the conversation that we haven't had um, how is this policy what does it mean on the ground and then how do we apply it um, because before it's 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 exciting to see a new development any new development we want ribbon cuttings and we want to have something flashy and I think this is you know really guiding us to say that we really need to put intent behind it because with climate change we know these expenses are going to continue they're not going to go away and so we have to be extra critical and careful with what we have left Great. Any, uh, Kate, did you want to add anything to that? Or? Yeah, I mean, we, 
so we've done um, some analysis kind of around um, around that that asset uh, infrastructure asset um, impact with one of our coastal clients um, down actually Galveston County, Texas. Um, and one of the things that um, they were really starting to grapple with is exactly what was just alluded to, which is, you know, we have this huge road um, road plan um, for, you know, building new roads and resurfacing them. And they're actually in our most vulnerable areas. Um, so really starting to get their arms around, um, you know, what these climate events could actually mean for them, um, like was alluded to billions of dollars potentially of, of lost investment um, that they just put into the ground. Um, so I, I really just want to agree um, wholeheartedly that really taking into, into account um, what these climate change events might mean for, um, you know, for your infrastructure is, is a big piece of the puzzle. And I didn't realize that, that you all experience daily flooding. So I'm, I'm really sorry, sorry to hear that. Um, but, you know, it's something that we see a lot in, in our client communities. And, um, you know, it's something that needs to be taken into account when you're thinking about your long-term financial health for sure. Great, thanks for that. So, uh, so with that, maybe I'll ask if anybody on the panel has any final thoughts or questions for Kate or anything that's kind of popped in over the course of the conversation? I could just add a little on the climate change. Like I spoke about infrastructure in the adaptation side of what we can do to make our infrastructure more resilient. And then we heard a little bit about cars and that kind of thing. That's talking to the mitigation. So what can we do to reduce the, the effects of climate change? So reducing greenhouse mm -hmm. gas emissions and that kind of thing. And obviously there's a big part of that in infrastructure planning as well. Um, using recycled aggregate in your roads, for example, um, the type of repairs that you do to sewers and water mains can generate different amounts of greenhouse gases. So those kind of decisions are, are important as well. And relating to development and where you put it, if you need a pumping station, then that's going to be creating greenhouse gases. And in the climate change with more rain, the pump's going to operate more frequently. So you're building a future problem for yourself if you're not making good decisions now. Great. Thanks for that. The one thing I was going to add to, and it's, sorry, it's on that a little bit, but Kate had alluded to on the one slide that she had on the single family home versus uh, all other types of development, basically, is that's what really hit home with me years ago when I started learning about this stuff was the idea of switching the mindset from spending to investing. So, you know, the idea of infrastructure and the type of spending you folks have to do every year on all new stuff as Rhonda kind of alluded to, the, as you see the metrics, invest that money, right? Because that, you know, as you're investing a million or a hundred million dollars, there should be a long-term payback. And the problem I do understand, and there's some counselors, some great ones here, and some, a lot of staff, that everything, uh, unfortunately, has a bit of a, a shorter horizon than it might need to, to have. But I think they'll, uh, with some longer-term vision, those can be investment conversations, not spending conversations. No, uh, Rhonda. Yeah. And I, I'm, I'm just so excited. I love this stuff. I think this is, I thank you for bringing this, um, because I, th I think it's due. Um, but similar to the type of conversation that we've had with, with residential development, the same can be said for employment. You know, intensifying and densifying employment areas, you know, having industrial condo units that are 2,500 square feet with a block of them, you know, is going to generate a lot more employment than perhaps maybe, you know, five acre site of a, a distribution or logistics warehouse where three people are working in, in a, with a forklift. So I think there's ways, um, you know, that, that if this is the policy and this is the direction that the community wants to go in, there are so many, you know, innovative ways that we could apply it. That's great. So very, very exciting to hear sort of a, a broad perspective on sort of how we can hopefully put some of this into action. Yeah, go ahead. The, the warehouse needs huge fire flow provision as well, which is big water mains, so, which is expensive again. So like, like you, Rhonda, every conversation and every little sentence that comes out in this discussion, it just triggers another little piece of the puzzle. Okay. Kate, I think I'll, I'll go to you then for final, final words or, or thoughts before we do a wrap up. Sure. I just want to commend you all, first of all, for, you know, having this conversation um, for it sounds like you have elected officials and staff there. Um, you know, I what I see, um, you know, based on what I've heard from you tonight and, and what I've learned a little bit about Peterborough over the past month or two, um, you know, you all are really putting your arms around some difficult problems. You're facing them. You want to know more. Um, you know, you're way far ahead of a lot of your peers, I'm sure, in Canada, but definitely way far ahead of probably a lot of the folks that you've seen in some of the slides that I presented tonight um, down here in the U.S. Um, so I just want to commend you all 
for you know the, your leadership um, and your forward thinking. And um, I think that I'm looking forward to, to seeing what's next for Peterborough and learning um, how you take some of these concepts that I've shared tonight and you know hit the ground tomorrow running and think about how you could start to make those small moves um, and small changes that lead to you know, larger impacts in the future. So I, and I really appreciate having the opportunity to share um, Urban 3's work with you all tonight. Uh, no, thank, thank you, Kate, for joining us. Uh, it, was, uh, it was a pleasure. I know that I learned a lot. I'm sure many other folks here did as well. And um, yeah, I hope this is uh, sort of step one of a continued conversation where we kind of, uh, kind of put some of this and put some, some momentum behind this and, uh, uh, and uh, use this kind of way of thinking to help us uh, prepare our, our community for, um, for being a destination of, of choice for businesses and residents moving forward. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, with that, folks, thank you very much. Uh, we're going to wrap things up. Uh, as I mentioned, the hope is this starts an ongoing conversation uh, supported by evidence that positions us as a future-ready destination of choice. Um, a recording of this event will be posted on Connect PTBO, and there we'll have a way for folks to submit questions or ideas uh, for future discussions and ongoing dialogue. Uh, we'll also be using that portal as a preliminary point of contact for folks that are interested in these critical discussion topics. Um, also, we'll be building on this through upcoming consultation and engagement approaches to inform uh, the ongoing asset management planning, uh, some what that James had mentioned, uh, as, uh, to come in line with the regulations uh, as we start to have these difficult conversations on de desired service levels and the financial sustainability of de delivering those services. Um, so yeah, we look forward to the conversation continuing, and I wish you all a very great evening. Thank you very much for your time today. Thanks. Have a lovely thank, evening. Thank you, Good Kate, night. and thank you very much to, to our panelists.